Air Corps around, which is the debate between Jim Johnson and uh, Professor Takarov on the question, does the world need more sweatshops? And there are tickets for that event at the reception desk in CFAB, the church building. So if you'd like to come to that, uh, make sure you get one of those tickets. Uh, I know Professor Takarov's students are getting tickets as well. So please don't get two tickets unless you're going to pass it on to another student, uh, which is great. But uh, that's the event next week, so I hope you'll see us for that. And that's going to be over in Griswold. So please make plans for that. That's Monday, April 4th at 7 o'clock. I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors for uh, both of these events, uh, the John Templeton Foundation and the Institute for Humane Studies. The Institute for Humane Studies advances a freer society by facilitating the development of students and scholars who share an interest in liberty. And if you have any questions about IHS programs, they have a lot of good summer seminars, for example, uh, programs for undergraduate and graduate students, please contact me and I'll be happy to assist you. Now, IHS, the Institute for Humane Studies, is enabled in their sponsorship by the John Templeton Foundation. The John Templeton Foundation serves as a philanthropic catalyst for discoveries relating to the big questions of human purpose and ultimate reality. Now, as our gracious co-sponsor, IHS asks that you fill out a student survey to let them know how much you like the event. And at the conclusion, what we're going to do is pass out some QR codes. It's the first time we've done the survey online, and there will also be a link on there, so ideally you can just fill that out online. Now, if you want to fill out a hard copy, some of you may have been at the Poverty uh, Incorporated film or some of our prior events. Uh, we do have a hard copy as well, but uh, it's probably just easier for you to fill it out online, so just get your hands on a QR code. We'll just hand them out in the aisles and fill that out, please, after the event. And uh, I know that for some professors, I know for me, for example, if you're uh, looking to secure extra credit, it's important to fill out that survey. Well, when students encounter Plato's Republic for the first time, they are surprised by Plato's concern with the content of art and drama and its effect on personal and national character. And Plato articulated a timeless truth, which is that those things that entertain and amuse us are probably far more important and consequential for society than the intent of our laws and our courts. A modern expression of this ancient concern about art and culture is found in a quote attributed to Andrew Fletcher, a Scottish statesman who said, quote, let me write the songs of a nation, I don't care who writes its laws. The power of popular culture in our society is a topic that merits much more attention than we give it. But tonight, we're going to take 90 minutes to consider an omnipresent force in American popular culture, film and comics, a crossover whose characters define the most popular franchises in entertainment today. But while many of us are likely fans of these franchises, have we given much thought to their power as modern political parables, helping us to think, helping us to, helping to form how we think about rights, liberty, and the proper role of government. And with one juggernaut franchise from DC having just steamrolled over the critics to $170 million in ticket sales, although Mark and I are talking about this and then apparently it's collapsing, uh, and the even more impressive Marvel franchise, uh, Captain America Civil War, to be released next month in only a couple of weeks, uh, now seems an excellent time to consider the political and cultural significance of these modern parables. With us tonight to help us is Professor Mark White. Professor White received his PhD in economics from the University of Cincinnati and teaches in the Department of Philosophy at the City University of New York, Staten Island. He's taught economics and philosophy at the university since 1998. He's authored or edited over 20 books on economics and philosophy, almost half of which address the intersection of philosophy and popular culture. This includes The Virtues of Captain America, Superman and Philosophy, The Avengers and Philosophy, Batman and Philosophy, which apparently is the most popular title, and his forthcoming book, A Philosopher Reads Marvel Comics Civil War. But Professor White is just as much at home writing about Manuel Kant, public policy, health care, tort law, or managerial incentives. Though I think he much prefers this that. In addition to his numerous books, you can find him writing for a number of blogs online, as well as in numerous academic, and academic journals and edited collections. 
Uh, Professor White is going to speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll turn to questions and discussion. And uh, I brought Mark here because he'd be happy to engage a whole range of questions. For example, he can help me understand why I have to see Superman in the new Civil War, uh, and why Batman versus Superman ran about 75 minutes too long. But we're going to say all that uh, for, uh, uh, after the lecture. So please join me in welcoming Professor Mark. Thank you, Professor Moose. Thank all of you for coming. Thank Northwood, the IHS, the Templeton Foundation, who have been very good to me. Okay, let me start this off by just trying to get to know my audience a little bit. Is uh, how many of you read comics? You know, fairly regularly. Okay, not not a huge number. Okay, how many of you see the superhero movies? Ah, okay, good. Good. That's good. Okay. How many of you like Professor Moose? <laughs> good. Okay. So, Professor Moose graciously invited me to talk today about superheroes and liberty and security. Okay. Uh, let me ease into this kind of by explaining the relevance of this topic, though I think that's the easy part. Okay. Liberty and security have always had sort of a tenuous relationship. Uh, Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin wrote the famous line about those who would sacrifice essential liberties for a little bit of security deserve neither. It's a very controversial quote. It's not <laughs> sure exactly what he meant by that. But it illustrates the fact that these two are normally contrasting against each other. And never more than since after 9-11, have these become a constant topic of national debate. Okay, the fact that we were attacked not by a nation, such as in former wars, but by individuals not associated with any particular political group that had enormous destructive power, made the country, in fact the world, think differently about security and start taking measures which more than ever start, you know, threaten to impinge on valuable liberties. Okay. So we had, move the pictures. We had, I keep forgetting there's a picture up there too. Yeah. I thought that's so great, I have a picture up there. I think you guys haven't seen that, that's awesome. I've never seen that before. So now of course we have very familiar names. I still look at that one. <laughs> <laughs> Old house diehard. The NSA, Homeland Security, the TSA, the Joy of Every Air Travel. Okay. We have editorial cartoons like this, mocking the surveillance state. All right. We have this unique confluence of events where not only do we have this apparent need to be more careful, more diligent. If you see something, say something. How many times have we heard that? Okay. At the same time, then we have an ever increasing capacity to watch people. Okay, surveillance technology, the ways to defeat encryption or just legislate around encryption, and immense data storage, computing capability. Okay, all of these things gather to let the government record more information about us, watch us more and be more vigilant about possible threats. <laughs> and this naturally leads to conflict. This naturally leads to resistance. Okay? You have the government saying things like, if you're not doing anything wrong, why do you mind if we watch you? And of course the people resist this and say, why are you watching us unless you think we're doing something wrong? <laughs> So the government is on the side of trying to enhance security, just giving them the benefit of the doubt. Okay. While the individuals are saying we have valuable liberties that you're infringing upon. Okay, if we're not doing anything wrong, we shouldn't be subject to government surveillance. Okay, so we have this increasing tension simply because of the age we live in now, as well as the government's increasingly advanced capacity to keep this information, to gather it, keep it, process it. 
We've already seen this in some of the movies and TV shows we watch. Okay, this isn't the movie I'll be talking about most of the time today, but in Captain America the Winter Soldier. Okay, the main plot about this movie was Captain America and Nick Fury uncovering a S.H.I.E.L.D. plan called Project Insight. What was Project Insight? They weaponized three helicarriers, I don't know how well you can see that, and they loaded them up with software that can analyze the DNA of every individual on Earth, use that DNA to try to make behavioral inferences, and say, is this person likely to do something criminal or something dangerous or something involving terrorism? If they are, we'll take them out. There's dozens of guns on each of these ships. Okay? And near the end of the movie, when Project Insight is put into play, we actually see on the screens millions of people targeted. Well, that person's got a certain gene that makes them more prone to violence, so we'll just take them out. Okay, this is a nightmare scenario. And Captain America tells him in fury, this is fear, this isn't freedom. This is the government being, being afraid of people, the people that it's supposed to represent. And there's signs that we're heading towards this day. Okay, we're predictive policing and predictive punishment. In other words, paying the penalty before you do the crime, because there's a good chance you might do the crime, is becoming a real thing. This is an article from earlier this year from the City Journal, published by the Manhattan Institute, about predictive policing in New York City. Now, this is a very mild version of this. This is just New York City using collected data, behavioral data, socioeconomic statistics, etc., and using it to predict what, part, what parts of the city need more police presence than other parts. Okay. This is a public relations disaster waiting to happen because everyone knows which groups are going to be targeted. Certain socioeconomic groups, certain racial groups, certain, certain ethnic groups. Okay. It's all going to be covered by, you know, the, the, by a gloss of scientism and say, well, it's just the data speaking, it's not prejudice, it's not bias, but someone decided to gather this data, someone decided to interpret it this way, it, it's going to be a huge storm. But this is just the first step, okay? If you, if you, depending on how paranoid you are, okay, I try not to be, but how paranoid you are, uh, did any of you, it's, just, it's going back a while, it's kind of an old movie by now, but do any of you remember the movie Minority Report with Tom Cruise? Mission Impossible guy. Okay, that was about the same thing. Philip K. Dick's story, science famous science fiction story, about you know predictive, preemptive policing and punishment. Stop the criminals before they even commit crimes. Not in the traditional sense of catch them in the act and stop them, but stop them before they even get to the point where they can do it. The hypothetical: go back in time and kill Hitler as a baby. Okay, but do it on a wide scale and definitely not just Hitler's. Okay. Incidentally, this is the plot of the upcoming Marvel Comics storyline Civil War II, which is a sequel to Civil War. Civil War, this was the story that really got me into Marvel Comics. I was reading DC since I was a kid. Never really got into Marvel Comics. More an economic decision than anything else, I just couldn't afford to buy both. I wanted to buy a whole line because I like the idea of an interconnected universe. Okay, if you read comics, you know what that means. Okay. And I just, you know, I grew up on Super Friends and the old corny Batman shows, so I liked the DC heroes better. Never got into the Marvel heroes. But around 2004, 2005, I got into Marvel, and then this came out in 2006, and it just blew me away. Okay. Again, if you don't know much about comics, uh, I'll fill you in a little bit. Since the mid-80s, both DC and Marvel started focusing on event storytelling. Okay, no longer were stories just contained in a single title or maybe in a series of issues in a single title. There were line-spanning events. Okay, Secret Wars, Crisis on Infinite Earth, Zero Hour. Okay, they're usually a mini-series starring all the heroes and then you had tie-in issues from all the books supporting the story to one extent or another often less. Okay. 
Civil War was one of these event mini series, came out in 2006 and then 2007. It's probably the most ideologically rich large scale comic story ever published. Okay? And that, that's what really blew me away. Because on the surface, it's a bunch of people in costumes fighting each other. Okay? Not fighting the villains, heroes fighting each other, which always kind of gets to me. I mean, what, what's the point? But there's a point to this is that these heroes were fighting for ideas, and they were good ideas, but they're ideas that came into conflict. And guess what those ideas were? Liberty and, say it with me, security. security. Great. Wolverine, by the way, wasn't in the story very much, but he sells books, so he's on the cover. <laughs> Seriously. All right, so what was Civil War about? Real quick, Prime. It all started in Stanford, Connecticut. A team of young, inexperienced heroes named the New Warriors were filming a reality series, as your young <laughs> superheroes do these days. <laughs> and they decided to take on a big time villain named Nitro. Nitro standing for nitroglycerin, he blew up. That was his thing. <laughs> So they're fighting him, they're not doing a good job of it, and Nitro says, you guys want ratings? You guys want a big show? I'll give you a big show. Boom. So if he doesn't just go boom with the heroes, he goes boom with half of Stanford, Connecticut. About 600 people die, dozens of, dozens of them school children playing in a local school playground. And here's the aftermath. Okay, the heroes come look. They're not just sad because of these innocent civilians that died, they're sad because of why it happened. Because a bunch of inexperienced, trained heroes messed up, took on a threat that was way too big for them, and didn't handle it very well. And people died, a lot of people died. And symbolically, we see Iron Man and Captain America at the forefront, and it is those two that are gonna take sides over the ensuing battle. Now, this wasn't the first time the disaster happened as a result of the result of it. We shoot that. As a result of superhero activity. Okay? This had been building for a while in the Marvel Universe. Okay? Uh, the Hulk had recently ripped up Las Vegas, killing a few people. Uh, the, the island of Genosha, which was set up as a mutant sanctuary. Okay, just like all the X-Men movies, people in Marvel Universe don't really like mutants. Okay, so the mutants adopted an island called Genosha that was wiped out. Okay, actually by kind of one of their own. Anyway, there had been this increasing trend of disasters, deadly disasters related to superheroes, and people were starting to get freaked out about it. Okay, Stanford was just what it took to finally move the people to move their legislators to pass a law. And that law was called the Superhuman Registration Act. And basically what this law said was that anyone with superpowers had to register with the government, reveal their identity to the government, submit to training, and be held accountable for what they did. So depending on how you look at it, they'd be shield agents, they'd be government agents, they'd be military. But the point is they would no longer be independent heroes and they would no longer have their secret identities. They wouldn't be revealed to the public, but they'd be in a government database, which was wild, widely held in a world that has psychics and people that can interface mentally with computers to not be the safest thing to do with some of secret identity. So this is where we're at after the first issue of the series. And like I said, these two guys take up very opposing positions. We have Captain America, Definitely against it. Okay, this is a panel from Civil War number one. Captain America is reacting rather negatively to S.H.I.E.L.D. Director Maria Hill, who has just told him, Captain, you're going to help me round up heroes that resist registration. Okay. Captain America is not too fond of this. <laughs> Says you're going to arrest people who risk their life for you every day. And she said, no, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to obey the will of the American people. I'm trying to needle them, get to the source line. 
He says, don't play politics with me. Now, Captain America, if you don't know, has had plenty of history with the American government. You know, anyone who thinks that a Captain America is some jingoistic toady of the U.S. government could not be more wrong. He has resisted the government more than he's cooperated with it. You know, he, it's, it's that he, he loves America, but he doesn't always like the people who run it, who don't live up to his standards for what, how they should live. So he doesn't like mixing politics with heroics, mixing politics with principle. And he basically tells her he's not going to do this. He's not going to play along. He imposes registration. And we'll talk more about why in a few minutes. Iron Man is more than happy to play along. Again, we'll see why in a few minutes. This is at the end of Civil War I. Iron Man is talking to the President of the United States. He says, don't worry about Captain America. I'll deal with that. Okay. Notice his fellow super geniuses, Reed Richards and Hank Pym, behind him. This is a good example of the arrogance of intelligence. Okay. With the exception of Professor Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> This can really also be a parable. I mean, I'm getting off track a little bit. But I'll try to drop in a few mentions about, you know, kind of the, the whole sexual planning debates and why you have the geniuses on one side, you know, supporting intrusive government activity and kind of the normal people on the other side saying no, the people with a little more common sense. And then most interestingly, and unfortunately, it's not likely to play a large role in the movie, because okay. this is the basis for Captain America's Civil War coming out soon, if you weren't aware of that, is Spider-Man. Okay. Spider-Man plays an essential role in this story. Everyone focuses on the Captain America versus Iron Man. Okay, those are definitely the, the title bout. Okay. But Spider-Man is the man in the middle. Okay. He's the guy on the ground. He's the point of view character for the reader. Okay, Captain America and Iron Man are like these gods striding over the earth, and Captain America is the guy on the ground who has to live with all this. This is all personal for, for Spider-Man. Okay, why is this personal for Spider-Man? No one, and this is widely acknowledged in the comics, no one has gone to greater lengths to protect his secret identity, and no one has more to lose if it's revealed. Because he's got people close to him that he cares about more than anything. And I'm talking about two people in particular, his Aunt May, Okay, if anyone's seen the movies, knows how much he cares about his Aunt May, is basically his mother. Okay, and his at the time wife, Mary Jane Watson, Parker. Okay, <laughs> the two people in the world who mean the most to him and who he's gone to extraordinary lengths to protect his secret identity to save them from all the trouble that would come to his door if anyone found out who he is. Okay, so he knows more than anybody the importance of being able to operate in privacy and secrecy with autonomy at the same time that he dedicates his life to protecting the people of New York City and the world. Okay, most of all, Mary Jane and Aunt May. Okay, so all these debates between liberty and security, while they're on a, a higher idealistic political level for Captain America and Iron Man, they come home for Spider-Man. Okay. And if you ever read this story, or if you've read this story, you know that the Civil War miniseries, the seven issue miniseries, kind of skims over the surface of a lot of this, but the Amer Amazing Spider-Man Civil War trade that covers like eight or nine issues of Amazing Spider-Man has got Spider-Man's entire story and what he deals with throughout the storyline. It's essential, an essential uh, component of the story. Okay. Like I said, likely to be under play in the movie. He, he's just got a glorified cameo in the movie. I don't know if there's going to be another kind of, you know, man in the middle character. I doubt Black Panther is going to be that. At least he shouldn't be. Okay. But Spider-Man goes from one guy's side to the other throughout the story because he sees the point that both of them's making and just changes sides once he realizes that one is going too far. Okay, I won't tell you. Okay, so what, why do Iron Man and Cap do this? What, what, what is it about their characters that make them side with these political views? Okay. And I argue in the book, in my book, I wrote the book, that their ethical viewpoints align perfectly with the sides they take in this debate. So in other words, Iron Man's essential ethical code makes him support registration 
Captain America's code makes them oppose it. Okay? Now, Iron Man can be understood mainly as a utilitarian. Okay? Utilitarianism is the ethical school that says you maximize the good for the greatest number of people. Okay? Or just generally you try to make the world a better place. Okay? But a better place in terms of some measure of well-being, some measure of utility, some measure of happiness. Okay? So if you can make more people happier, that's what you should be doing. It's also characteristic of a, of a pragmatic outlook. Okay, you know, any of you who know a little philosophy, I'm not talking about American pragmatism like Charles Saunders Peirce, okay, or, or Don Dewey. I'm talking just the common sense sort of the sense of, of pragmatism. Okay, do what you need to do, do what works. Okay, this is Iron Man to a T. Okay, Iron Man is a pragmatist. He takes the world as he finds it, he tries to make it better. Okay, we see up here, he's explaining to his best friend, Happy Hogan. Okay. If any of you know the story, you know this is one of the last times we see Happy. Okay. He's explaining to the Happy Hogan. He's not really crazy about registration. He opposed it. He went in front of Congress and argued against it, making some, some of the same arguments that Captain America would later make after it was passed. Okay. He didn't think it was a great idea. But once it was passed, he said, okay, it's passed. There's no use fighting it anymore. Let's deal with this the best way we can. Let's take what we're given and try to create the best world we can out of it. And what does Iron Man, the arrogant super genius, think he ought to do? Well, I'm going to take charge of it. Of course. Who better? I'm the smartest guy in the room. Okay, now that's Professor Moose. Okay. And he says, why can't the other heroes see this? I'm doing this for them. I'm not just doing this for the American people. I'm not just doing this for the President of the United States. I'm doing this for them. Do they want some other idiot in charge? Okay, I don't know if they want that idiot in charge, but he certainly thinks he'd be in a better place. And then later on in the next panel, Happy tells him he's really the only one that can do it because he's the only one that's a superhero, but also kind of a normal guy. He doesn't have any superpowers. He's not in his guardian god. Okay, it's kind of laughable. He's not a normal guy either. He's a you know billionaire genius inventor playboy. Okay, <laughs> I'm a normal guy. <laughs> well, basically, Tony is going to do whatever Tony. I thought it's Tony Stark, Iron Man. Okay, I didn't know that. Okay, Tony's going to do whatever Tony has to do to get this going. Okay, and if that means cutting some corners here and there. That's what a pragmatist is going to do. Okay? For instance, he engineered the building of a, of a prison in an antimatter dimension called the Negative Zone to house heroes that refused to register. He called it a temporary measure, and then he started calling it a permanent measure. Okay? He helped design a, a clone of Thor. Thor was off planet during this whole episode. Lucky Thor. Okay? But they built a clone of him from a little piece of his hair that Tony kept from the very first Avengers meeting in 1960, whatever. Okay, kept it for this day when you have to clone him. Clone went nuts, killed another superhero. Okay? Collateral damage. Very regrettable, but again, that's part of the corners that had to be cut in order to make registration a success. Of course, that's the main criticism that anyone would lobby at utilitarianism was utilitarianism explicitly sanctions reasoning that says the ends justify the means. We've got this thing we have to do, we'll do whatever we can to do it. Okay? Even if that involves cutting corners, even if that involves some things we think are wrong, that's what we're going to do. Okay? And that's the exact stance that Captain America takes against Iron Man. As Captain America maintains that there are some things you just do not do even for a worthy cause. Oh, that's more Tony and Happy. Okay. Again, this is Tony saying, who else is going to do it? Who's better suited to support registration and protect my friends than me? Okay. Here's Captain America after an uh, intimate moment with Agent 13, Sharon Carter. 
This is a family program, so I didn't show the earlier panels. Okay. And this is Captain America explaining why he opposes registration, why he sees it as such a threat to liberty and rights. Okay. Here he's explaining that you know he has, you know, just by existing in the world and having people around him, he's put those people in a danger. Because he hasn't protected his secret identity. He's just Captain America. Steve Rogers, Captain America, everyone knows that. Okay, but people who've lived with him, interacted with him, have been in danger because of that. So he's basically isolated himself. And he's accepted this, but he's saying, why does everyone have to make this choice? Why can't people have the right to operate as superheroes but maintain their secret identities and protect their loved ones? Why can't it work both ways? Here he is at the end of the Civil War story. He's being interviewed by these two. No, no. He's being interviewed by these two journalists. That's Sally Floyd and that's Ben Urich. If any of you watched the Daredevil season one on Netflix, that's the comics version of Ben Urich. Okay, I know he looks a little different. But here, Captain America puts it as as, as blankly as he can. He considers the Registration Act a violation of essential civil rights. Okay. And as such, he sees those rights as limiting what the government and Tony Stark are able to do legitimately to enforce registration and to protect the American people. Okay. In other words, he doesn't think the ends justify the means. He thinks there are definite limits, things you cannot do even for the most worthy ends. Captain America is what we call a deontologist. Okay, that comes from the ethical school known as deontology, which is usually contrasted with utilitarianism. Utilitarianism says do the most good. Deontology says do what's right, or more importantly, don't do anything that's wrong. Okay, so while utilitarianism is usually stated in terms of maximizing the good, doing the most good, making the world a better place, Deontology emphasizes what you shouldn't do while you're doing that. Okay, most of the Ten Commandments. Okay, do not kill, do not lie, do not steal, etc. Okay, those kind of moral prohibitions. Okay, deontology itself isn't that concerned with what you do as much as what you don't do while you're doing it. Okay, so the lines you can't cross, the corners you can't cut, even in pursuit of a worthy goal. Okay. The Bill of Rights to the United States Constitution is mostly in terms of thou shalt not, like the Ten Commandments, except for the government. The government will pass no law abridging the freedom of speech. The government will pass no law restricting the, the, the you know, religion, et cetera, et cetera. Freedom of assembly, you know the drill. Hopefully you know the drill. Okay. So Captain America believes in these essential rights and liberties because he's a deontologist. Okay? He focuses on right and wrong. Tony, utilitarian, focuses on promoting the good. He doesn't care so much about right or wrong. Okay? This is where the essential conflict between them comes from. Is they have different ethical viewpoints, different ideas of what is the best thing to do. And that ties directly into the positions they take in this debate. Okay, Tony sees security as a utilitarian issue. I want to make the American people as well off as I can. And if I have to build a prison in the negative zone to hold my friends, if I have to create a clone of Thor that might kill my friends, those are things I had to do. I regret them. They, they, I can't sleep at night, but this is what I do. Okay. After Sally and Ben interview Cap, they interview Tony Stark. This is after it's all done. Okay. And Sally's basically applauding him, not for all the corners he not for all the corners he cut in support of registration, but all the personal sacrifices he did too. Okay, this kind of paints his utilitarianism, his pragmatism is also heroic. Okay, because I tell you, Tony Stark didn't come out of this very well. Okay, spoiler alert, at the end, Tony won. Okay, Captain America surrendered when he realized that too many people were getting hurt in the battle. 
Captain America surrendered. Tony won. He was appointed director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Okay. But then all the political machinations started to come out. All the financial manipulations. Okay, Sally and Ben, with the help of Peter Parker, once he turned against Tony Stark, discovered all the financial dealings. Tony made an enormous amount of profit off the Civil War by knowing when certain laws were going to be passed, knowing when certain initiatives were going to start, shorting certain stocks, buying certain stocks, making millions of dollars. Okay? And these journalists were about to go and come in and blast them with this information, except they found out one more thing. He funneled all that money he made into victims and survivors groups to fund the families and survivors of people who were killed in the Civil War. Okay, so uh, you can't slam him for that. It's a good thing. Okay? But again, he did it in a way that's not really virtuous, is it? It's, it's, you know, it's kind of dirty, and if any, like I said, when they first found out about it, they are like, oh, this is kind of slimy. We, they thought he was personally becoming rich. But even after they found out he gave it all to charity, they still didn't feel great about it. Here, Sally's confronting him about a whole side story from the Civil War Frontline series, which this is related to, which is based on the story of these journalists looking into behind the Civil War. When he, he, he concocted this whole Atlantean controversy to basically increase support for the Registration Act and hopefully speed the resolution of the Civil War. In the meantime, he was hated throughout the hero community. Even heroes that agreed with the registration and sided with Tony Stark didn't like him. They couldn't believe what he was doing. I mean, Spider-Man left them all together. A lot of other heroes deserted him. Even the ones who agreed with their station didn't like the way that Iron Man was going about it. So he was persona non grata by the end of this episode, by the end of the story. He was in charge, but no one liked him. Okay? The thing Sally recognized, he probably knew this all along. He's a genius. He can see the future in his own way, not supernaturally. Okay? And he did it anyway. Even though he has no friends anymore. No one likes him. Probably going to have trouble getting heroes to go along with him anymore. But he thought it was important enough. Okay? So this is what you see at the end. This is what you see from the story. Captain America and Iron Man fight. Okay? This is, I mean, this is very similar to some of the promotional images that came out in the movie. But once you look behind it, again, they're not just fighting. At the end, they were just fighting. That's why Captain America surrendered. But through the whole story, they're fighting for ideas. Okay, And for someone who works with ideas for a living, this is amazingly satisfying to find in a comic book. I mean, I always loved comic books when they were just fun. Okay, And when it was just good guys fighting bad guys. Okay, here's good guys fighting good guys, which I normally don't like. This is just pointless. Okay, but here is for a reason. Not because one of them's mind control, not because the other one thinks the one sucks with his girlfriend, but because there's actual ideas at the core. They're fighting over concepts. And they're fighting over concepts that can't be easily reconciled. Okay. Now what's interesting about this is you read more into the series, and you see that not even these two are as absolute about their positions as it might seem. Okay? Remember, a lot of the reason Tony supported this was to protect his friends. He wanted to keep them in the best position he could. He told them, do you realize what the government wanted to do? The government wanted to shut you people down. I stopped that. Okay? I got him to just make you register, but you can still operate as heroes. Okay, it would have been a lot worse for you had I not stepped in. So he was protecting their liberty, he was protecting their autonomy, but in a pragmatic way. Okay? Captain America, at times, sounds like the hardiest supporter of registration. Okay? Uh, in the 70s, when he was fighting a 1950s version of himself that completely went off the rails, the super soldier serum didn't stick well with him. He didn't get the Vita rays that didn't make the super soldier serum. It's, it's a whole thing. But basically, he, he turned into a horrible racist. Okay, that's not funny. Okay? And, you know, Captain America doesn't like racism. He had to bring this guy down. 
So he brought him down, but then he thought to himself, there but for the grace of God go I. You know, I'm lucky this stuff worked on me, the whole super soldier theorem and Vita Race. Okay, no, it didn't work on anyone before me. I'm lucky it worked on me. It didn't work on him. Is this his fault? This could be me. I didn't get any training. They gave me the stuff. I burst out of the shell. I was all muscular. They threw me in the front. Okay, I turned out pretty good. Maybe I wouldn't have. Maybe I should have been trained. Maybe I should have been held accountable. He was basically making Iron Man's arguments 30 years before Civil War started. And then, later on, years down the road, Captain America puts, gets put in charge of global security, running S.H.I.E.L.D. and everything. And you know the first thing he says? This is from the Avengers Prime miniseries, if any of you have read it. He says, Tony, I've got to think about whether I'm going to let you use that armor anymore. Tony's like, whoa, what happened to Mr. Civil Liberties? You know, now you're in charge. Now you're deciding who gets to be a hero and who doesn't. Okay. So neither of these characters are as absolute in their positions as it seems. As pictures like this definitely make it seem. Okay. And what's lost from a picture like this, and what comes out of Civil War, and what I try to bring out of Civil War in my book about it, is that these concepts need to be balanced. You don't choose one or the other. Okay, despite what Benjamin Franklin seems to have said. You don't choose freedom and neglect security. Okay, if you don't have security, you don't have any stable environment in which to exercise your freedom. Okay, but you can't go too far over to security either, because if you emphasize security too much, then you don't have any freedom to exercise. You have to find the balance. And what these two really differ on is where that balance is going to be. Okay, Captain America doesn't neglect security. Iron Man doesn't neglect liberty. They just draw that line in different places. Okay, and that's the sentiment, that's the way to look at the way a lot of Americans feel about our current situation with the NSA, the TSA, the Department of Homeland Security, is that that line is getting pushed closer and closer to emphasize security and de-emphasize liberty. Okay. So the reason I write about civil war, other than just I love to, is to show that by looking at these guys, and the different discussions they had during the Civil War, that can help us think in a different way about our own debates over liberty and security. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Bye, my <books. laughs> Mark, I'll just let you run Q&A. Okay. And then during that, uh, we'll hand out the QRs and then go. If anybody wants paper survey, see me after. But we'll just hand up QRs while you guys uh, discuss things with Mark. Well, I'm paid for the whole 90 minutes, so. <laughs> yeah. much of it. I mean, where he was worked really well. Okay? I, I think his most important role in it was, you know, the, we all know who the Punisher is, right? If you're watching Daredevil Season 2, you definitely know who the Punisher is. Okay? The Punisher is basically the, the spirit of vengeance. Okay? He just kills criminals. He proudly kills criminals. And basically, he joins up with Captain America's resistance and says, I want to help you. And Captain America, at that point, is kind of beaten down, getting a little desperate, says, ah, all right, all right, I know who you are, I know what you do, but we really need people on our side, okay? Until Punisher starts doing what he does best, with all respect to Wolverine, Punisher kills, okay? Specifically, when Spider-Man was coming over to Captain America's side, a couple criminals caught him, they nearly killed him by beating him with an inch of his life. Punisher shot down, brought Peter Parker back, and told Captain America what he did. Okay? And then Captain America wasn't having any of it. Captain America beat him up. Punisher wouldn't fight back. Wouldn't fight, wouldn't fight anybody but Captain America. He worshipped Captain America, another former soldier. Okay? And then Captain America realized that 
by accepting the punisher and accepting somebody who did things that he stood against, he was compromising too much. One of the fascinating things about Captain America that I showed in my book about Captain America is that he has compromised his principles. He has to, okay? You know, aside from his super soldier serum searing through his veins, that he's an exemplar of human perfection, okay? He is still essentially a human being, and he has to make tough calls, especially with all the situations he finds himself in. And sometimes he has to compromise his ideals. But that was a compromise too far, and he realized, listen, I'm fighting with Iron Man for cutting corners. If I let Frank Castle, the Punisher, into my ranks, I'm cutting one corner too much myself. Okay, and I, I loved when I can't remember who it was, Nighthawk, some C level hero, you know, watching Captain America and Punisher fight and says, Why won't Punisher fight back? And I think Nighthawk says, Because they're both the same guy. And Captain America heard them and said, Yeah, I am nothing like him. And mainly he's saying, Because Punisher crosses that line, he kills. And the, the, the handful of times that Captain America has taken a life outside of the context of war. He has beat himself up over it so much because that is a line he never wanted to cross. But unlike someone like Batman, he does when he realizes it's necessary, even though he feels tremendous regretful. Okay, there's like a whole six issue thread in the early 80s with him killing him. You know, you had a, a terrorist who was gunning down a church full of innocent civilians. And Captain America didn't have a shield. He had a rifle on his back because he was masquerading as one of the terrorists. The only way he could stop this man from killing innocent civilians was to shoot him. A, a justified action anyone would judge, but Captain America hated that he had to take that step. He hated that he couldn't find another way out of the situation. Okay, that's why he, he you know, felt so bad for making that same, the similar mistake again by almost accepting the Punisher on his side. So, great question, thank you. Uh, which side would you go on, the Captain America side or Iron Man side? Well, I mean, the point I'm trying to make is, there's, there's, you know, it's, it should be thought of the sides, because they both have a point, right? What now, I mean, which side would I be closer to? Because where do I draw the line? That's what you meant. Okay, I would come closer to the Captain America side. Okay, because you know, just personally, I'm not defending this philosophically or anything, but but personally, I'm one of many people who think if you sacrifice too many freedoms, you're letting the other side win. You know, it's become a cliche to say if we do this, if we keep taking our shoes off of the airport, the terrorists win. Okay, that's a, you know almost a category mistake. Okay. But, you know, that is a point, that if we change our lifestyles too much in response to terrorism, then what the terrorist wanted to do to us succeeds, okay? And if we engage in too much surveillance, engage in too much, you know, if we give up too many of our liberties, we give up too much of our privacy, I think we are, we're not letting, I'm not saying that's what they want, I'm not gonna use the language we let them win, but I do think that's things we shouldn't have to do. And there's other ways to make us secure that don't violate the, the essential principles that we value as Americans. So I would side more with Captain America, though probably not go as extreme as he went. I have a follow-up question sure. with that. I got a little controversial. With the, uh, uh, you're from New York, correct? Yeah. Okay. So the gun control debate, okay, as far as putting that context with Captain America, or Iron Man, what do you stand as far as that goes? Well, you know, Civil War, you know, Civil War, if you didn't notice, I'm sure you all picked up on this, but Civil War came out five years after 9-11, was uh, uh, just, you know, I mean, depending on how you look at it, an overt or shameless, depending on whether you like this or not, you know, analog to post 9-11 America. I mean, Stanford was 9-11, the Registration Act was the Patriot Act, a, a you know rushed piece of legislation trying to deal with the terrorist threat. Okay, uh, the negative zone prison was Guantanamo Bay, uh, and the whole issue of registration. I mean, this is the one thing that that, that 
isn't a 9-11 analog, is the whole idea of registering superpower beings is gun control. Okay? In fact, that's made very apparent in the, the storyline in, in Iron Man, just before Civil War started. Uh, he's he, subject to mind control. And of course, you control Tony Stark, you control the armor. Okay, so someone takes control of Tony Stark's mind, they control the armor, they, I think they, they destroy a plane out of the sky, killing 200 people. Okay? And of course, Tony knows he wasn't responsible, but he can't help feeling responsible, because it was his armor, it was his mind. And people afterwards are telling him, you're not responsible. Okay? He says, your armor's just a gun. Someone else, found, someone else shot it. Someone else fired it. And what did Tony say? Yeah, but maybe... This gun needs to be... registered. Okay? And then Civil War starts. So that, that, you know, that made it apparent, obvious, that it was really a gun registration, gun control metaphor. Okay? And it's really the same idea. Okay? With, with some qualifications. I mean, you know, it, there's a lot of controversy over how the Second Amendment is interpreted. Okay? But if you interpret it as a right of individuals to bear arms, then the whole conflict argument about that is individual liberty versus security. Okay? And every time there's a massacre, especially in a school, again, you know, this is. This is the school setting in Stanford was the emotional heft of the storyline. Okay? This debate is brought into, you know, uh, you know, the forefront. Okay? And, you know, how much do we value this individual right to own guns versus the safety that could be generated? And this is an empirical question, how much safety would be generated? Okay, if we put more limits on them, and there's arguments on both sides. Okay, but that, 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 thank you for asking that, because that's an element of the story I need to bring out. I think the 9-11 analogs are obvious, but the gun registration is kind of, you know, where the story takes a little bit of a left turn, and they put that in there, and it doesn't completely fit into the 9-11 narrative. I, I think it works as far as the story, but it doesn't make it a pure 9-11 narrative. Well, that's exactly what I said. You know, that example at the end where I said Captain America becomes head of global security and tells Iron Man he's going to have to give up the suit, and Iron Man resists. Okay? That's exactly what happened in many earlier Iron Man stories when the government seized his weapon. I mean, that, that movie was based on uh, many stories, especially Stark Wars in the early 80s, where the government says they're exactly like Iron Man 2. Okay? There's too much of this Stark tech floating around. Too many criminals and terrorist organizations have gotten their hands on it. Okay? We have to get it all, including Tony's designs, and Tony basically tells them, forget it. In, in harsher terms, but, you know, forget it, okay? So, yeah, that's what I was saying, is neither character is, is pure in one position or another, okay? I wouldn't call it hypocritical, but just complexity, okay? You know, notice that, you know, I mean, this is, I, I, I shouldn't say notice, because I don't think I mentioned this, but, you know, Tony accepting registration, he was the first one to register. Now, of course, he's in charge of it. It's kind of like you know, the chief executive saying I pass a law that affects everyone else and has marginal effect on me. And Tony was already essentially out in public anyway. Okay? And Tony's walking around in armor, so he's not really in that much danger. <laughs> okay? But you know, I, I often praise the Marvel superheroes for being much more consistent in concept than the DC heroes, just because they were planned that way from the start in the 1960s. They're endowed with certain character traits, speech patterns, problems, flaws that were consistently maintained by creators over the next 50 years. The DC heroes, by contrast, were written very haphazardly over the last, you know, if you think of Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman over the last 75 years. 
Okay? And there's much less consistency to those characters. But that doesn't mean the Marvel characters are simple. They still have a certain amount of complexity, and that's you know, a lot of what my version of the Captain America book was about, was digging that complexity out of Captain America. So, so you're right. Yes, Iron Man doesn't really, isn't entirely consistent. But who among us is? You know, and that's certainly something Captain America brings up. But, you know, I, the, I, one of the most emotional appeals that, Ken, that Iron Man makes, there's a great one-off issue called uh, Iron Man and Captain America Casualties of War, early in the Civil War storyline, where Cap and Iron Man basically meet at the uh, ruins of Avengers Mansion. That's a whole other story. <laughs> and they basically talk it out. Okay, and Iron Man basically gives him this argument that I'm, you know, I'm driving an unregistered, unregistered weapon. Okay, and I'm a drunk, Tony Stark. Okay, and you know, and he says, Captain America, you remember when I got drunk? You remember what happened? Okay, and he's like, Well, we held you accountable. I said, Yeah, you did. You slapped me on the wrist. You you, you put me in detention for a while at Avengers meetings. But I wasn't really held accountable. I wasn't tried. I wasn't put in jail. Okay, I should be. So I mean, the fact you know, Tony uses his own flaws to say, "Listen, we're not like you." He says, "Captain America, you're perfect. If we were all you, we wouldn't need registration. But we're not all you. We're perfect. We make mistakes. We need to be held accountable for." Them. Okay. So I think that's that's the the deeper issue issue here is not who gets to own the armor, as who gets to control it, and under what circumstances they get to control it. And Iron Man wanted to limit that out of respect for his own imperfections. Good? Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I haven't read the comic books, but like, going off like the trailers for the new movie, do you think they're going to go in the route with the, like, the Civil Liberties, with the Captain America, or with the Civil War, or are they going to go more focused on just like the Bucky Barnes uh, whole storylines. What I've seen is uh, I have never really picked up this whole uh, like registration debate by just the trailer, but that's interesting. Yeah, I mean it's different for me because I you know I'm viewing the trailer against all this stuff. So that's interesting that you see that differently. Okay. Well what what I think is gonna happen, I mean again this is read this is watching the trailer in the context of all this. What it seems is going to happen is because, you know, thinking about the trailer, you know, General Ross goes over all the uh, disasters with Captain America and Black Widow and Scarlet Witch sitting there. It says, you know, that something has to change. Uh, I, you know, Captain America says, I have to keep operating like I'm operating. If I see something go south, I have to step in. Iron Man says he wants to punch him. Stupid, stupid line. <laughs> okay. But and then we see a building fall. It looks like the United Nations building. And we see Black Panther in the wreckage. Okay. I imagine what's going to happen is perhaps some of Bucky's old programming is going to be triggered. Because that kind of reminds me of near the end of the original Winter Soldier story in Captain America. One of Bucky's last acts under his Soviet programming was to bring down a huge office building in Philadelphia which is also cited as one of the precipitating incidents to Civil War in the comics. So what I'm thinking is Bucky will probably either unintentionally or accidentally trigger that accident, which is going to involve Black Panther. And then that's going to start, that's going to be the precipitating incident. That's going to be the Stanford. Okay. And I, I, I don't know if it's going to be registration per se, but I think it, at least it's clear to me from the trailer that someone's going to suggest some limitations. Because that's the whole context of the little snippet of dialogue we get between Iron Man and Captain America. It's Captain America says, I'm going to keep doing what I do, and Iron Man says, I have to put stop to this. Okay. So it'd be very, I'm very interested how they're going to play it out. I mean, like I said before, unfortunately, Spider Man's not going to play the role he really should play in the story. But they didn't know he was going to be in it until the last minute of filming. Okay. I don't, but like I said, I don't know if they're going to bring another character in to play that role. You know, Ant-Man, maybe. Ant-Man, Spider-Man, you know. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. 
stories where some of the X-Men can pass. Right. I mean, everyone knows the X-Men is an analogy to minority representation. Okay? Whether it's it's you know the Jews in the context of these and future past, whether it's gays and lesbians, I mean every disadvantaged group, I mean this is one of the reasons X-Men speaks to so many people, is that it really represents the struggles of every underrepresented malign group. So you get a lot of that. You get the fact that, that you know, Jean Grey can pass, but the Beast can't. You know, or various ones. You know, obviously some look human, some don't. It wasn't really brought up so much in Civil War with respect to Iron Man, though the, the question of whether superheroes who didn't actually have any supernatural abilities, you know, Iron Man relies completely on the tech. Even after extremists allowed, you know, he reprogrammed his body to interface with the tech, he was still basically a human being. You know, Hawkeye, Black Widow, uh, Black Widow has some chemical enhancements. But, you know, you get the idea. Did they really have to register? And, and the question was kind of vague on that. They, they weren't very clear on that. But I'd say the one part where that was brought up was that scene with Happy and Tony, where Happy said, you're the perfect person to take charge of this, because you can see both sides. You are the normal guy who is also a superhero. Again, you're not an Asgardian god, you're not a chemical enhanced super soldier, etc. You're one of us who happens to pal around with them. You can see both sides. You can see why you need to protect the normal guys from your friends. But as far as, as being able to take off the suit and not be, okay, I, I don't remember that being dealt with, but that's an interesting angle. Thank you. You're Professor Moods have a question. He's staring at me. <laughs> well, you explain why Superman's going to be in a movie, so I feel better now. Spider Man, yeah. So, is there a. Do you think that this contrast of ideals, both of which have legitimacy, but. Uh, sort of work together. Is that supposed to be in Batman versus Superman, and wasn't leveraged well? Or? It, yeah, yeah. If you're very generous, you can read that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, well, I mean, just the the the, the, one, of the one of the frustrating things about Batman v <laughs> Superman, and believe me, I'm so I have so many conflicting feelings about this. <laughs> But one of the frustrating things was it is it hinted at so many important issues and didn't get into any of them. Because Zack Snyder is so focused on the big emotional moments and the big dramatic cinematic gestures. And he doesn't just want to let the characters talk for a little bit. Okay? And the whole idea of calling Superman before the Senate to account for what he's done. You know, basically, you know, questioning superhuman power, which, which is, you know, yeah. And, you know, again, this has been a, a major theme in American superhero comics since the 80s, since Watchmen, since Dark Knight Returns, which inspired Batman to be Superman. And, you know, it, again, it, was, it could have been dealt with, but it wasn't. Other than Batman saying, I have to bring him down by killing him. It just, you know, <laughs> it, it. So yeah, it, it, it could have been, and if, if it had been done differently. It could have been, I mean, you know, there's been dozens of stories over the years about, you know, is Superman too much of a, a power, too much of a loose cannon to be trusted and everything? And even if we decide we don't, what can we do? Okay, or do we have to live with it? 
you know, Dr. Manhattan and Watchmen. Any, any of you read Watchmen? Maybe watch Watchmen? Okay. What do you do in your literature classes? Or you don't have literature classes, do you? Okay. Well, I mean, you know, what, you know read Watchmen. Read Watchmen. The, the hilarious thing is, you know, okay, if there's two of you out there that have read Watchmen, I'll talk to you. Is that Watchmen, if you read Watchmen, it almost predicted Batman v Superman. Watchmen was this classic story by Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons in the mid 80s. So it's now considered time, time rated at one of the top 100 novels of the 20th century. And it really explores kind of a realistic world containing superheroes and what they would do when they're all imperfect, even imperfect by Marvel standards. You know, this is a DC comic. And it basically explored unchecked power. Okay, you, have, you only had one superpower being, that was Dr. Manhattan, who was transformed into basically a god by a nuclear accident. Okay, and he transforms global politics. He basically stops the Vietnam War instantly by wiping everyone out on both sides. <laughs> okay, he changes the history of the world from that point on. Okay, and the, the, the argument they're making is this is what Superman would do if Superman really existed. Why would he let wars go on? Why would he let people get killed by natural disasters? It's this whole omnipotence of God argument. <laughs> okay? If, if God is all powerful, why does he let people die? Okay? If God is all good, he must not be all powerful. He can't be both, which was mentioned in Batman v Superman. Okay? And, and then you had Ozymandias, who was the smartest person in the world, who basically took the ultimate utilitarian step, and he wiped out a couple million people to get the rest of the world's people in line. And he saw this as an acceptable cost, which in pure utilitarian cost-benefit terms, it may have been. But most of us would think that's an atrocious step to take. Okay, so Ozymandias really, really you know, presents himself as the ultimate, you know, worst possible scenario for utilitarianism. You know, all the, all the scary stories we tell about utilitarianism to argue against it. Okay, it's a brilliant book. But, it's, but the, the ironic thing is it's a cautionary tale against doing realistic superheroes because realistic superheroes don't end well. Okay? Superheroes are fantasy. They're supposed to be fantasy. They're not supposed to be realistic. And that's what Moore and Gibbons were really trying to say with Watchmen. Say, listen, this is what would happen with realistic superheroes. Don't let this happen. What did everyone who read the story in the 80s say? This is what should happen. And this is the trend we're going to take you all with all superhero stories going on. Okay, and that's when you get the grim and gritty and dark and anti-hero and killing and everything. And you know, it all comes from Watchmen but because people didn't get it. Now, that's the sad part. And that's why we have Superman v. Batman v. Superman, which incidentally was made by the same man who filmed Watchmen. So he didn't get it either. <laughs> That was cathartic. Thank you. <laughs> it was.